a government that has no opposition, it becomes everybody's affair to do anything they want and there is no voice that would go against the government no matter what they are doing. We are now coming together to show solidarity so that we can bring about a faster solution to the Naga problem. They do not want to compromise their position as leaders and when the other groups come in, if they did come in, there will be questions about who will be the leader. At this moment, Mr. Muiva is in complete and total ironclad control over the organization of NSCN. There isn't one single member in the NSCN IM who can argue, debate or question Mr. Muiva. He is all in all. His word is the law. I am exclusive interview with Sir KK Sema, retired IAS, one of the founding members of ACOUT. So, Sir, uh, the NPF and DPP are all BJP. They have come together and formed an oppositionless government. In order to facilitate an early resolution to the long pending Naga peace talks. So there was a similar situation in 2015. 2015, there was an oppositionless government. Uh, so do you think that uh, this time there will be any positive outcome? Nuli? What will be the difference this time? The difference will be that it will be the same thing as last time. <laughs> <laughs> you see, uh, in a democracy, it is an absolute requirement, mandatory requirement more or less, to have a strong opposition for one simple reason that when a government runs, it does a whole lot of things that are perhaps in the effort to do good, they may do a a lot of activities that may not necessarily be uh, financially appropriate and when something of a government's policy is not working, the opposition points out the deficiency in the management system. They represent the people. So when there is a strong opposition, the government is always on the toes to perform properly. But the moment this opposition disappears and you have a government that has no opposition, it becomes everybody's affair to do anything they want and there is no voice that would go against the government no matter what they are doing, you see? The end result is when there is this much of corruption going on, there isn't an opposition to check it. So here I find it very surprising basically because we Nagas seem to have uh, lost all sense of uh, propriety. You know, we don't seem to have any more dignity left. The important thing is, first of all, having this oppositionless government and then forming a core committee or group with an excuse to show solidarity to solve the Naga problem. It's just an eyewash cover-up story, but the bottom line, as far as I personally am concerned, is that the election is due in, in, in another year's time, one more year to go, and then when the election comes, the people who are in the opposition have not had opportunities to make money. Okay? And so, by way of using, bringing solution as quickly as possible as an excuse, they are now joining the mainstream government basically because they get an opportunity to earn a little more money before the election comes. This is 
they will say everything to prove their worthy inclination or intentions by saying we care for the people and therefore we are now coming together to show solidarity so that we can bring about a faster solution to the Naga problem. It is an eyewash, you see, because as far as the, the working group underground or the, the national workers and the NSA and IM is concerned, they have been conducting negotiation with the government of India and they have never been able to come together. You see, FNR had tried very hard to bring the fact, uh, warring factions together. They tried sincerely and they worked very hard. And finally, they managed to bring them to some kind of a, a coming together kind of a thing. But where NSC and I forgave all the other factions and then they also asked for forgiveness from other factions. But as Christians, forgiving one another is good. But the principle of forgiveness is when I forgive you and you forgive me, now we are on equal terms. We are equal. I cannot ask you to become my subordinate after the, both of us have forgiven each other's uh, commissions and omissions. But here the NSM says, all right, we forgive you. You please forgive us. Now you all join me, join us, telling all the other factions to join the mainstream that they call themselves, the NSA and I am. And so all the other factions were unwilling to join NSA and I am. And here the bottom line is NSA and I am's leadership they do not want to compromise their position as leaders. And when the other groups come in, if they did come in, there will be questions about who will be the leader. You see, these kind of ticklish issues come up, and NSA 9 is not about to give up its uh, leadership, okay? So the end result is there is no way that working group, seven working group now, and NSA and IM can come together. This has been proven fact tried and failed. Now here the government is setting up a core committee in order to bring them together so that they would have one solution. Hmm? But they have, they have, the NSA and I is not about to let all the other factions join, uh, join the mainstream without uh, leadership question being unanswered, is he? All the others, when they come in, necessarily, let's say Kitovi is there as one of the bigger leaders on the other side of the fence. What happens if he were to join NSC and I? Hmm? He would want some position and Muiva is not about to give him. Hmm? Muiva wants to remain the head of the movement, but suppose Kitovi wants that leadership, there's no way Mr. Muiva will give up. So these are the ground reality problems in which the question of these working group and the NSA and I'm coming together in order to find one solution is not going to work. And the working committee, they also know it. The politicians also know this. But as I said, it is all a cover-up. They want to make sweet sound as a real genuine feeling for our people when the real actuality of whatever they are trying to do is to get into the government so as to make a little money before the elections come. It's as simple as that, okay? Sir, so, uh, based on what you have said, do you mean that uh, the, core the formation of core committee was not at all necessary and uh, the core committee is not going to bring any difference? Core committee being formed is just a gimmick. Yeah, it's a political gimmick. Nothing much more, nothing much less. They can, they can say a whole lot of wonderful 
philosophical things about how much they are making sacrifices. Their sacrifices is to join the government in order to make money. It's as simple as that. Okay? And so they are not going to be able to resolve anything. They said they are facilitators. What are they facilitating? Nothing. Right from the beginning, they facilitated nothing, and they will continue facilitating nothing. Okay? It's just a show. It's just a cover-up with uh, whatever philosophy they may like to project to the people, to convince the public, and so on. Uh, the whole purpose is totally different, and core committee is not going to be making any kind of a difference in all of these things. And they can hardly even convince the government of India that uh, this solution should be brought about quickly. What they are saying here in Nagaland, what they say in Delhi, we never know what they've been talking to the government of India about. Hmm? And uh, to all, for all practical purpose, we do not know whether even the state government wants a solution in the first place. So here we are playing around with uh, the lives of our people so carelessly, and uh, today without an opposition, it means corruption can now reign freely without any breaks. That's as simple as that. And uh, opposition people are saying they are not demanding any post, no position. They public may, publicly may say that, but just watch out. Hmm? In the coming days, they definitely would be searching for some cabinet positions, some positions in the government. They are not just going to remain as opposition MLAs only. Okay? That will come about. No matter what they are saying, the internal undercurrent is they definitely are asking for some kind of a position within the government that they are joining now. Right? And uh, for all you know, there may be two, three deputy chief ministers in Nagaland with all the opposition-less situation. So we never know. More ministers, more additional chief secretaries, I mean chief ministers. These are possible in Nagaland. Anything can happen in Nagaland. <laughs> so so uh, if the talks between the government of India and the Naga groups have come to effect end, then... Uh, why do you think there is... Uh, what exactly is the reason behind the delay of the settlement? You see, this issue is... It looks simple and yet it's quite complex. You know, over the years now, the working groups, they have uh, gone through the whole process of uh, the negotiation with the government and they've come to uh, concrete conclusions foregoing the flags and the Yazabo issue, which they have left it for a slow progressive issues in the aftermath of solution as a process to continue. And so they have closed that chapter. NSA and I also had basically done the same thing over the period. And as far as the government of India was concerned, they felt that the negotiation has already come to some reasonable conclusions. But then, even NSA and I am having said that things are going smoothly and well and so on and so forth, suddenly comes up with the flag and the constitution. Uh, yes, Abo. Here, the government of India is not about to give in to that demand. And NSNIM also knows it. It's not as if uh, these were subject matters undiscussed and now being brought about suddenly. They have had that discourse, discussion, and then the government of India had already given some kind of assurance of some kind that the due democratic process will be continued even after the uh, uh, negotiation is concluded. Things like issues like integration, integration of all the Naga tribes from all the other uh, states into our Nagaland state. All these issues have been kept pending for due democratic process. So you see, the talks have already come to an end, concluded, 
But then the reason why NSA and IM has come up with uh, the flag and Yezabo, they also have a lot of explanation that we are unique and there's got to be some uniqueness in the solutions and so on. And Nagas have been fighting over this many decades for sovereignty as a basis for everything that has happened. And uh, right from the, the total discussion that has happened, sovereignty more or less have been kept out of consideration. It was not considered. But within the perimeter of Indian constitution, whatever identity, protective measures that can be taken, government of India has been prepared to provide every possible thing, like improvement made on the Article 371A, for instance. Those were some of the things. Now here, we, the Nagas, must also understand some other perspectives here. Mr. Muiva, from his youth, he has joined the movement. All his youthful and uh, useful life has been spent in the national movement, okay? And today it has come, we have come to the end of a, a negotiation, a journey, and the way the solution has come up, Manipur gets autonomous territorial council, Nefa or Arunachal also gets, the state of Nagaland will remain as it is, and Mr. Muiva is not from Nagaland. So even if the solution comes, Mr. Muiva cannot become the chief minister of Nagaland. All his years that he has fought for, now Mr. Muiva hasn't got a place, landing ground, you see. He can at best go to Manipur and become the chief councillor in the regional autonomous territory or council in Manipur for the Nagas. But that's a bit too small for him, no? when he's been looking at the national stage to come down to that small little corner in Manipur as a head of that organization. For Mueva, that's much too limited, you see. Now, so there is no more place for him after the solution comes. No? Here lies the problem because if I were to wear Mr. Muiva's shoes. You see, the problem becomes intense because I have spent all my youthful life, you see? And after working so hard, we bring about a solution and I have no place within the solution that comes up, you see? At this moment, Mr. Muiva is in complete and total ironclad control over the organization of NSC. There isn't one single uh, member in the NSC and I am who can argue, debate, or question Mr. Muiva. He is all in all. His word is the law. You see? And within that authority that he holds, he has control over Manipur territory, he has control over Arunachal. His cadres are everywhere. His cadres are in Nagaland. And he is the boss. He would prefer to remain like this without a solution. And whatever time God allows him, he wants to die in harness, being in total control of everything. That's a better option for him than to look at the solution that Nagas want. And therefore, when the flag and Yezabo comes in, government of India is not about to give in to this. Mr. Muiva is insisting it has to be given as part of the solution. Now, it's a deadlock, you see? And there's no ability to go forward with this strong stand taken by NSC and IM. Government of India is not going to give in to this according to whatever has been said. So end result is the solution is not going to happen so early because NSC and I, especially Mr. Muiva, is not going to give up, you see. So that's the, the story of all the complication that is going on. Mr. Muiva may not want a solution.
that's the way I sort of make an assessment of exactly how the Naga political issue development is is coming into. That's the kind of picture I see. So to facilitate to the problems uh, regarding the uh, issues, uh, how, why they are not getting the settlement. So uh, why it is not coming into a conclusion and why the Nagas are not uh, getting the solution. So uh, the government of India says that uh, there will be only one solution, but there are two facilitated, uh, there are two parties now, which is uh, NSCNIM and seven NNPGs. So there are two negotiating parties. So what is your take on that, sir? Well, from uh, the standpoint of the government of India, they, no matter what negotiations has been conducted between uh, the government of India and the working group, and then the NSA and I'm separately, they are considering the possibility of ensuring that both the two groups would come together and sign the same document as the final solution. Now, I'm not very sure exactly how the government of India intends to carry out that exercise because there are elementary differences. Even in the situation of uh, what we call the competency clauses. You see, we as stakeholders are still unaware as to the totality of what NSC and IM is asking the government of India. But we have come to know a few things and uh, that the NSC and IM is demanding from the government of India. And a good number of things that they are demanding, I find questionable areas that is detrimental to the state of Nagaland. Hmm? Number one, there is no integration. So therefore, there is no expansion in the geographical boundary of Nagaland state. The state will remain as it is, okay, without integration. But the, here the problem is, in the competency clauses, NSA and I'm is looking at Nagaland as a base without that integration, number one. Number two, they are trying to create a statutory body called the Pan Naga Hoho. Okay? Now, this Pan Naga Hoho is a conglomeration of Nagas from all the other states as well uh, Arunachal, Assam, uh, Manipur including Nagaland, as member in, the, in that uh, statutory body. And uh, I have questioned how two statutory authorities can coexist within a given state because the elected government is the statutory authority. If Pan Nagaho also is a statutory body, how does the two statutory body operate, you see? And uh, here, the interlocutor, uh, Mr. Ravi, tried to explain, saying that uh, Pan Naga Hoho would be a statutory body, but it will be purely a cultural body, okay? Nothing to do with any other uh, perspectives other than just the cultural body, but it will be statutory because it will be created through an act of parliament. Uh, and uh, Pan Naga Ho is supposed to have advisory rule only. They can advise the government, the government can take or throw it out, whatever they suggest. That was the starting point. But even there, Pan Naga Ho's uh, scenario again has changed to a mandatory authority, you know, meaning, meaning what Pan Naga Ho says the government will have to implement. You see? Now, Pen Naga Ho is again another forum where they are talking about the upper house and the lower house, which is going to be created on the basis of solution. Okay, so Nagaland state will have the upper house and the lower house. The lower house is the elected people, like the MLAs, Rajya Sabha type, where people are nominated into the upper house. 
Now, Pen Naga Ho Ho, IM's intention is that the Pen Naga Ho Ho will nominate members in the upper house. Okay? And then again, the lower house, when it it it's, uh, tries to pass a bill, it has to have an approval from the upper house. Now, the Pen Naga Ho has appointed the members in the upper house to what majority, I don't know. They are not telling the Nagas how many people in, a, let's say, a seat of 60, Pan Naga Ho will nominate how many? Maybe 40, 50. Hmm? Meaning they will have complete control of people that they nominate into the upper house and the lower house, which is an elected body, hmm? even when they pass the bill, have to get the final approval from the upper house, without which that bill cannot become an act. Okay? So, you see, here I have been making a serious analysis that when there is no space after math of uh, the solution for a space for Mr. Mueva, Perhaps Pan Nagaho is the only space where Mr. Muiva can become the president or the chairman and have control over Manipur, Arunachal, and Nagaland, as he is doing right now under the uh, banner of uh, NSN IM. So that's perhaps the only kind of a space that Mr. Muiva can chair, the Pan Nagaho. And therefore, they are trying to make it mandatory, and that mandatory authority will apply in Nagaland, Manipur, Arunachal, you see? Now, those are a way out of uh, rationality uh, propositions for which I've said, number one, parliament cannot enact any bill or enact and create a statutory authority that is to be cultural body. Because under Article 371, customs, tradition, you know, everything is within the authority of the state government. So if such a pan Nagaho statutory body is to be created, it is the state government that should consider it, not the parliament. Parliament has no authority to meddle into the issues of traditions and customs and customary laws and so on and so forth. So if it's a cultural body, parliament cannot and should not because they'll be violating the very spirit of Article 371A, okay? But the fact of the matter is NSCNIM wants Pan Naga Ho Ho desperately. The working group people have said, we don't care and we don't want it, you see? These kind of differences are there between the working group and NSM. I also am not very clear as to how the government of India with this kind of differences, which are critical to IM and being thrown out of the window by the working group, how the two different set of people can come together to sign a, an accord that has these kind of issues where one says we do not want Pan Nagao, the other one says we must get. Now, how the government of India intends to solve these differences by signing, bringing them together to sign one accord, that you'll have to ask government of India how they intend to do this. Because uh, the meeting ground is pretty difficult uh, as we perceive it. And so, as of now, coming together for one solution, which the government of India is insisting, it is still going to be a hard kind of a exercise. But uh, I suppose in whichever way as it is, there's going to have to be some middle ground within which to take the whole problem through, I suppose. Uh, but as far as pan Nagaho issue is concerned, I think that is seriously detrimental to the state of Nagaland. And I support the working group when they say we do not want the pan Nagaho. Yeah? But once that is taken out, as I said, there's no space for Mr. Muiva at all after the solution. And the poor man is going to have to find some kind of a solution. The government of India may also have to look at 
the possibility of how to ease the problem of Mr. Muiva, give him some serious attention, and give him some space where he can, with dignity, actually occupy a space worth his dignity and his, uh, his personality. After all, that many years of sacrifice is no mean achievement, even on the part of Mr. Muiva, you see? And to have no place for him to land, it is certainly a very genuine and a critical kind of a problem. Without giving that kind of a space allowable to Mr. Muiva, I think the situation of Flag and the Azabo will, will continue and Mr. Muiva will die in harness, as far as I'm concerned. Sir, so as a prominent figure as yourself, what would be the final concluding statement you would like to give through this interview? Ah, uh, well, it's um, quite a frustrating little world that we are living in, you know, because everything somehow or the other are going out of gear. And uh, there is a whole chapter, for instance, despite the fact that the core committee has been set up with an, uh, the reason to speed up the solution and so on and so forth, and I said uh, they, are, they are murdering democracy by way of having a one government without opposition. You see, as I said, in democracy, a strong opposition is a pre prerequisite, you know? That's the only way a healthy government can exist and the welfare government can function when the opposition points out the, the negative aspect of governance of a government. But everything, again, in that vicious cycle falls on us as the masses or the people. You see, year after year, term after term, we are selling our votes and putting people in a, a place of authority. All our MLAs are there. They, they went shopping and purchased their MLA designation from the shop, like, you know, because they've bought it, okay? They have bought it. The simple truth is that we are supposed to be Christians, and uh, the Christian, uh, let, let's say NBCC as the father figure of the churches in Nagaland, and all the respective tribal churches, you see, have to understand that our Naga people do what we are doing, selling our vote, which is illegal, which is dishonest, which is, I think, the worst kind of dishonesty, because it destroys the value of democracy here, you see, selling your votes. And in Nagaland, even a rat with no brains, even a rat without brains, if he has money, will win the election. Huh? Our cows, our dogs will win an election as long as uh, they have a lot of money. That's the kind of people that we are electing here, you see. People who are honest and capable will never get an opportunity to be elected. And here, the vicious picture and the cycle that I see is that it takes, it's going to take a whole generation, even if NBCC thinks that now that election is one year away, we start the clean election campaign. You see, you cannot treat cancer casually, no? because this is a cancerous issue that has come up in Nagaland. And you see, the simple truth is, we have churches in, in uh, every village, and we are sending pastors there, all tribes have got their churches in the villages and the pastors are working. Now, all are Naga mission, as it is. Huh? They treat the pastors as a, a completely non-entity, you know. He is the lowest of the cadre in the mission service. You see? Treated with very less pay, so the pastors are working like a villager, cultivating, and then when the time comes for a Sunday service or a, a service night, he comes home tired from the field, doesn't even sometimes get enough time to have a bath 
pick up a, a Bible, just to do a lottery, open a, a Bible page and see which verse hits his eyes first, and then he rattles off all kinds of things that doesn't even touch anyone's mind, you know. So when you have pastors that are working in the church out there, giving indifferent sermons every Sunday throughout the month and the years that he is there, what's happening is we become Christians by virtue of having been born Christians and then getting baptized and whatever. We are, we are Christians, but without the Christian value, you see? Because when elections come up, Nagas will lock up Jesus in the biggest box with the biggest lock for six months. Hmm? At least six months, Jesus Christ is locked up in everyone's box. Hmm? And then you come out with Christmas wishes. Hmm? I wish I had a car. I wish I had a bolero. I wish I had 10, 10 likes, 15 likes, 20 likes, kind of wish list come up. And you have the pastors and the deacons also generally explaining uh, if only God would listen to my prayer and give me one bolero kind of a thing. Huh? And if he gets it, he says, ah, God is so kind. You see? Where he sells his vote and gets the benefit of it. So, you see, we are Christian and just as much as I say I am a Chishi from a Chishi clan, we all belong to a Christian clan, but there is no Christian value involved in that Christianity. That's basically because day in, day out, our pastors are unable to really go into the hearts and minds of our people to become real value-based Christians. Then, in times of election, you would call upon that virtue of honesty, uprightness, and look at the personalities that want to represent us, and then we can have decent, honest, hard-working people that have honest concern for the people. But the moment we elect the kind of people that we get elected through spending money, you see, the vicious cycle comes up over and over and over again. You know, day by votes, the MLAs, they buy votes. They're spending, in terms of crores, 15, 20 crores is being spent to buy votes. And that money, they are begging and borrowing, mortgaging, selling, everything they have as a property, they are doing this. So when they come to government, you know, even the best of us have no choice. You just have to find ways and means to make up that money that I have spent during the election. That's the natural thing that's going to happen. And if you have got your house on mortgage, you are going to try and save it. At least the minimum shelter, you see. So in this desperate situation, corruption, when government money comes up, non-transparent ways of doing things, becoming corrupt, is a natural thing, you see. And we, as a people, are causing it. Hmm? We are causing it, you see. So the church needs to understand the long-term perspective, not just go for a clean election campaign a few months before the election, but look at the core reason as to why Nagas are what we are as valueless Christians. Huh? And there, 24 hours, year after year, that same pastor, he is doing his best. It's not as if he's not. But then when you have limited abilities... There's nothing much you can do. And they are not being upgraded. They are not being given any kind of a backup to instill into the community exactly what they must do to create a very lively value Christians in the community that he's serving. That's not happening. The end result is, as I said, we don't even think twice. To lock up Jesus in a box is, is just a play time, you know, for the Nagas, you know. They'll only open after the election is done. So Jesus is heading for a very difficult time because the election is going to come soon. <laughs> so that's the way it is.
So we would like to have our people look at the, the real desperately cancerous situation our society has become, and we are creating corrupt, corruptive system, encouraging it, and not being able to even say anything against it with an opposition-less government, you see? So I think uh, you we just need to wake up, that's all. Nagas need to rethink exactly what we are doing to create this rot in our society. That's about it. <laughs> Thank you so much for all your input, sir. So, uh, I do interview Thagishu with Sir KK Sema on matters regarding uh, Naga political issues, Naga political solution, and core committee. Aro Taiwa, Taila final statement de Kushe, ki Nagas need to wake up. For more updates, follow NLTV Mui Imnas Nla with camera person Joha.